uh, side, if you like, of the of the equation in all this. Is that government's viewpoint? And uh, I don't know about you, but that, that's, I found that very encouraging, what uh, Senator Rudy had to say. Um, I'd like now to invite John Pinnell of the Jersey Disability Partnership to give what might be called the, um, the people side of the argument. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning. My name is John Pennell. Um, I'm a, currently the CEO of the Jersey Voluntary and Community Sector, which is about to pack up, but uh, I'm also part of the Jersey Disability Partnership. Uh, thank you very much for giving me a, a, a chance this morning to give you a brief presentation on the view of the Jersey Disability Sector. Uh, I'm not, of course, the only voice of that sector, as there are at least some 200 voluntary organisations involved in providing services within that sector, uh, many of which are represented here today. But for the last four years, I've been working with the Jersey Voluntary Community Sector, which was set up to provide a voice, of course not the only voice, but a voice, that could provide some representation on issues which affect and concern many charities and non-profit organisations, and therefore affect our whole community. Uh, and that, of course, involves government policies such as disability legislation, and a previous example was the Charities Law. Uh, we are asked by government specifically uh, to be an independent, critical friend of government. We sought to build partnerships both within the voluntary sector, but also between the voluntary sector and the states of Jersey sectors. When I say sectors, the different departments. Uh, we also sought to build capacity, awareness, and credibility for that sector. Uh, and importantly, we worked very hard to promote awareness of disability, because as uh, Paul Rucher alluded to, uh, a lot of people, a lot of corporates don't really understand uh, some of the challenges that face people with disabilities. And we've also uh, encouraged the government, we've been pushing an open door, but encouraged the government to get on with legislation, disability legislation, including all the steps that lead up to that. Um, so, Perhaps I'm representing the view of the Jersey Disability Partnership, which meets fairly regularly, and uh, this is going to continue. I, would, I may be talking to the converted, but I'd just like to remind you in the broader context that the voluntary and community sector in Jersey is very active. It comprises about a thousand organisations, of which about 350 or so are charities, and the others are non-profit organisations, so it's quite big. Uh, there are thousands of volunteers in Jersey, freely giving hundreds of thousands of hours a voluntary service to our community, or community may be more appropriate because some of those work overseas. Um, as in the UK, the sector is enormously diverse. It covers arts, environmental, faith and community groups, overseas aid, sports, animal welfare, uh, women's organisations, and of course health organisations, mental and physical health organisations, which um, comprise about, say, about 200 of those. Um, having said that, uh, and I was a soldier for 25 years, one of my scariest moments was giving a presentation to the Jersey Women's Institutes. <laughs> the front row of the audience, which comprised my mum, uh, my aunties, and several of her friends that I'd known for 40 years, were no longer my mum and my aunties. They are the Women's Institutes. Uh, it's like being grilled by a, a group of investigative journalists. They're very sharp, and uh, it's one of the most intimidating sights um, I've ever seen. And in the back of my mind was the thought that perhaps they're like the Gurkhas and they take no prisoners. <laughs> the health related charities, uh, most of which are involved in some form of disability support, uh, as I say about half or more of the 350 known charities, and there are other organisations as well. Perhaps what may be surprising is that the diversity found in the UK is mirrored in our very small community of 100,000 people, 100,000 or so, depending on whose statistics you listen to. Um, I think that, uh, and Paul Rucho is a great champion of uh, the sector, has often said, uh, well done and thank you to the voluntary sector. And I only mention that because I think that the work done by most voluntary organisations is to some extent unseen, uh, but certainly should not be unthanked. Uh, I'm also the commander of St John Ambulance Jersey and a couple of other charities, and I've been so for the last 12 years. So the point, what's the point of that? Well, the point is that many of you here are involved in more than one charity. And again, I think it's a, a bit of a, uh, a stab on the back, really, for Jersey people. They do get involved so, in so many different charities and so, uh, so completely. Uh, I know volunteers give a 1,000 hours a year of their time. That's 10 hours a week. 
but want that um, to that's 20 hours a week to to their charities. That's fantastic. So back to disability. <clears throat> it's been quite a long journey, as Paul alluded to. The formation of the Jersey uh, until the formation of the Jersey Disability Partnership, which was initially sponsored by Shop Mobility in Jersey, there's no government initiative to review the island's position in respect of the breadth, depth and the social consequences of disability uh, in all disguises here in Jersey. In fact, and I tried to find it, there were no government figures from any source to realistically identify the scale and depth of disability in Jersey. So there, the start point was really quite a long way back. Um, and with the backing of our 200 or so members of the Jersey Disability Partnership, that includes individuals, organisations, some state departments as well, and I'm very pleased to see some here, uh, not least poor old Will, pulled out of Social Security, gets volunteer for every one of these meetings. Um, but we uh, managed to uh, push the government a bit, the Chief Minister and his colleagues, including Paul Rucher, to get on with three things, really, to begin the process of dragging Jersey into the 21st century. So let's not misunderstand this. We are 40 years behind legislation almost anywhere else in Western Europe, uh, and certainly as far as its stance on disability and enablement is concerned. So the catalyst was detailed research on the whole issue, and we pushed very hard for it to be both a medical model and a social model. There's not much point in identifying how many people there are in Jersey with what form of disability unless you understand their needs and the impact of those needs on their family and on our society. This was conducted in 2015, and the figures were released in January 2016. Um, Anna Hammond of the Chief Minister's Department, who's here somewhere, um, oversaw this and did a terrific job, in my view. Uh, Paul didn't mention the figures, but just to remind you, on the medical model, there are some 13,500 people in Jersey, roughly, who have been diagnosed by a medical professional with a disability, but if you take the broader UN definition, which is some form of impairment which affects your family, your social, or your working life, the number goes up to about 34,000. Well, that's a third of the population of the island. So this is a big issue. And it affects arguably a third of the island's population. And through them, of course, their carers, their families, and so on. So it's a big, it's a big, it's important. Um, this obviously informed much of government policy going forward. And, uh, and has recently produced the strategy framework, consultation document due up tomorrow, I think. Uh, and again, she's done a terrific job on that. So it's not a question of you know, lack of action, it's really a question of trying to push the thing through in some reasonable time frame. I'd also say that Paul Rucher, and I have to say this since he's here, uh, no, not at all, has been a great champion of disability in Jersey. Uh, and and you know, it's no surprise to see him here today leading the charge on these speeches. Having identified the numbers, the second outcome is to develop the strategy, uh, and this is now what is coming out for consultation tomorrow. Uh, please do, as Paul said, please do respond to the consultation, because it's important that your views, the voluntary sector's views, are known uh, and inform that, that process. If you look at it, the three-stage process, you've got the survey, then you've got the strategy consultation, then you produce the law. So the strategy should inform the law. Um, so that relies on your input to help shape that. And as we found with the Charities Law, we're able to influence it and make sure that it sort of fits our purpose. It does put us all out of business, for example. Um, the final action promised before this government finishes in May 2018 is for Social Security, because under our system, as Paul mentioned, it moves from Chief Minister's <coughs> Department to Social Security, who brought in all the other discrimination laws, uh, to bring forward discrimination legislation. And our view on that, and I think this would be agreed, why well, it wouldn't be agreed, it needs to be proportionate and balanced. It needs to be appropriate to our voluntary organisations and our society, uh, and put a structure behind dealing with the issues of disability and enablement in all disguises. That also should include a period of reasonable adjustment, not least for corporates uh, and business premises to adjust to whatever the requirements are. You can't do it overnight. My concern is that legislation may now be at risk uh, because although, as Paul said, the Social Security Minister, Susie Pennell, who I know quite well, <laughs> has committed to drafting the legislation in 2017, next year we go into the study season, May 2018 of the elections. And my concern is because of the time it's taken to get to this stage and the consultation documents and consultation on the strategy, it's not the final strategy, that if we don't get that, that legislation out you know, before the next election, the chances are you may end up with a new minister or ministers. In fact, it may have a whole bunch of new ministers, and it may be kicked into the long grass, and there'll be a further delay. <coughs> uh, 
uh, my concern is that uh, you know, time will tell, but if this doesn't happen before the next election, it could be pushed off for another year, and Jersey will remain one of the few advanced nations not to have a law to handle the situation. Um, I'd like to add that legislation alone is only part of the solution. There will be challenges to the strategy um, and then law, not least from part of the commercial sector. And we need to develop, we need the voluntary sector needs to work with government to address the concerns of the commercial sector, the corporates, and hopefully they'll get involved early on to say, look, this is achievable, this isn't, or we need a period of reasonable adjustment, whatever it to be. Um, I would say that looking at some of the previous discrimination laws, there have been outcries from some of the uh, smaller businesses about going kind to of put them out of business and so on. So keep reminding them that we are 40 years behind the rest of yes. Europe. So it's not a question of, you know, we shouldn't do this, it's a question of get on with it as soon as we can. I would say that there are some champions out there. The, a year ago, we ran a conference for the International Day of People with Disabilities, the UN Day. Uh, we had some fantastic champions from business talking. Seymour Hotels, who won a national award for their welcome program for both employing people with disabilities but also taking on board guests with disabilities. Liberty Bus, who've introduced a fantastic initiative about training their drivers over disability awareness and, interestingly enough, customer service, which has been very <laughs> successful. RBC, who also won the JET Award last year for uh, the best employer in Jersey. So there are great champions around. We need to get the rest on side because we don't want that to slow up the law. But my view, the greatest challenge is not perhaps bringing in the law, which is going to be uh, a big enough challenge, but it's bringing about the culture change. In other words, the change to the mindset of us as individuals and our society and our businesses that's necessary, uh, including those that work within parts of our government commercial sectors, to bring disability awareness and genuine equality of opportunity to fruition, whether it be socially, in the work environment, or in the home environment. And I do not underestimate the challenge that it is to change people's culture. The law is part of that, but we all play a part in that in terms of getting people to come on side with it. The point of that, as Paul mentioned, was to enable those with disabilities to reach their full potential and to live full lives to be able to work if they're able to work, but to be able to work if they want to, and to enjoy themselves, get some, some satisfaction out of lives. There are great examples of people, families and organisations that do it well, but much more needs to be done. Thank you for listening to me.